Hey, hey, good people. Happy New Year. I, it is hard to believe that we are in 2022 right now. If you're new to our community, my name is Doug Nilms. I serve as one of the pastors here at Renovation, and I am thrilled that you would be part of this online experience, either live or as needed in your spiritual journey. Our team considers it an honor that you would entrust with us this small part of your spiritual journey, particularly if you would not consider yourself a Christian. If at any point during this experience you want to connect with someone from our community, whether it is to find out more about who we are or if you have questions about your faith or honestly something totally off the wall, you can text RENOVATION to 94000 and we will respond promptly. If you're watching this during our live stream on Sunday, today was a bit of a curveball for all of us, wasn't it? Uh, we intended to gather for corporate worship, but wisdom and prudence led us to take this week to practice healthy rhythms of rest while we prepare our space for our current reality. We hope you will join us for corporate worship at Water Place this coming Sunday, January 9th at 10 a.m. If you would like more information, you can visit our website, which is renovationchurch.com. Right now, we will be spending some time in John chapter 20. And if you're interested in engaging more in this experience and with this text, simply scan the QR code on the screen for our Bible app event today. John chapter 20 is the Apostle John's testimony to the resurrection of Jesus and the events immediately following it. And today, we're going to be unpacking how the death and resurrection of Jesus specifically affected one of Jesus' disciples, the Apostle Thomas. A disciple who in recent history has gotten honestly an undue and awful rap. So if you would, read with me, beginning in verse 24. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I, be I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers in them, and place my hands into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe my Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Let's pray together, family. Holy Spirit, the words of the Bible are meant to bring life to us, and I pray they do so right now. I pray that as we address this text, that our hearts be open to what you would speak to us today. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's start here. We treat circumstantial certainty as a substitute for faith in God. Yeah. I mean, do I even really need to illustrate that with a story, or is that so overwhelmingly true that it stands on its own? I think if we can be honest, I think we can all agree that it stands on its own. And look, there's no shame here, okay? This is the natural pull of life. We would rather have our circumstances be known, certain, and concrete than need faith in God amid uncertain times, primarily because no one wants to live in uncertain circumstances. Uncertainty produces anxiety and stress. But the subtle pull when we find ourselves in predictable certain times is to overestimate our faith in God because very little faith is required of us. We treat circumstantial certainty as a substitute for faith in God. Enter the story of the Apostle Thomas, a person much like us who finds himself thrust into the center of great uncertainty that he did not ask for or see coming. A man simply trying to do his best to be faithful with the moment he's in. And the truth is that I hope we can learn today from his story is that faith in God is formed in uncertain times. But before we dive into his story, I, I want to give a bit of a historical backdrop to these verses. You see, when Jesus was taken to be crucified by the religious and political leaders of the day, the disciples scattered. Jesus was being tried for treason and they didn't want to die too. He was, in fact, crucified. The Bible seems to indicate this destroyed all hope his followers had for a better and brighter day. Three days later, though, he rises from the dead, which, of course, is a great place to start a sermon. And upon beating death, he begins revealing himself to people as proof of his resurrection, first to Mary Magdalene, which in itself is remarkable. 
Think of this, the first person Jesus counts as worthy to start sharing the good news of the resurrection is someone whose culture would have instantly discredited. In that context, women's testimony would have not even been considered under the sermon for another day, perhaps. Mary immediately tells Jesus' disciples what has happened. After validating that the tomb was empty, as Mary had reported, the disciples become even more fearful because they knew that the religious leaders would think that a, 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 a conspiracy was being orchestrated by them. And so the following Sunday night, they met behind locked doors to discuss what was going on. And while they are meeting, Jesus appears to them in the room, all of them save Thomas, for he is not present at that meeting. Why he isn't there, we don't know. But verse 20 tells us that when the disciples who were there saw Jesus, it says they were filled with joy. It is at this point the Apostle Thomas takes center stage in John's account of the resurrection. The Apostle John writes in verse 25, it says that they told him, we have seen the Lord. But he, Thomas replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into him and place my hand into the wound into his side. Considering his context, is Thomas' response that strange? By all accounts, this man had been forced into hiding because of his relationship with Jesus on top of what was most likely overwhelming grief from losing his friend and rabbi, along with the historical grief of knowing this is how it always happens. The empire always murders our leaders. And this is why the Apostle Thomas is one of my favorite fathers of the faith. He is just so brutally honest with where he is at. And there's something though that I think we can learn from his statement. You see, all that he is actually asking for is what the other disciples had already experienced. His demands come from the testimony of his community. He asked to experience Jesus the way his community has experienced Jesus. Look, if you're not a Christian yet, this should fill you with great hope. If you've been hanging around us for a while, you have most likely heard many of us talk about the ways Jesus has ministered to us. The many ways he, we have experienced him. The Apostle Thomas' life should encourage you to ask for the same. As Jesus, ask Jesus to meet with him and how the Christians in your church are meeting with him. But it simply can't stop with the request because look at what Thomas does next. It says that eight days later, the disciples were together again. And this time, Thomas was with them. Thomas is with his community. Amid his disbelief, he maintains relational connectivity with his community and he postures himself to experience Jesus where his people say he can be found. He takes his doubts with Jesus to the only a place for, the appropriate place for them to go, Jesus' people. He wrestles with his doubt with his community. There is a lot for us to unpack here. The first thing is to acknowledge what has happened to the modern Western church at large over the last several generations. At some point, probably because we've lived in pretty predictable times, the church got the rap of being a place for people who no longer had questions about faith. It became the destination for those without questions instead of what it was always meant to be, a community to work out your faith. The Apostle Paul echoes this statement in Philippians 2.12. He says, when he asked people to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. The community of Jesus' people was always meant to be a place where those who had deep questions, considerable doubts, and messed up lives could work out what they believed about Jesus and how to follow him well. The church is the place we bring our doubts. And this is important for us to truly live out because of the times we find ourselves. For the first time in most of our lives, we live in incredibly uncertain times. Most of the systems and structures we built our lives around have been shaken to their foundations. And when this happens, the natural tendency is to doubt what we have taken for granted, which naturally causes us to think that we don't belong any longer. But looking at the life of Thomas, and quite honestly, most of church history, nothing could be further from the truth. The church of Jesus is the place to wrestle with your faith. It is a safe and, quite honestly, the best place for skeptics and doubters. We know this because of Jesus' posture towards Thomas in the next verse. Look at verse 26 and 27. It says, The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing before them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Jesus honors Thomas' posture and request. He offers him exactly what he asked for. 
This shows us so much about the heart of Jesus towards those who approach their doubts with honesty and authenticity. What is interesting about the situation is that we are given no indication that Thomas actually takes up Jesus on his offer. It seems that all Thomas wanted was to simply be in Jesus' presence again. As I read this, my mind and heart went to the, a cultural moment that we find ourselves in, among men and women who grew up in the church and have become disillusioned with it. There seems to be a whole social media movement around this issue. I see so much of the Apostle Thomas in their story. He was hurt. If Jesus was, in fact, all he said he was, how could this have happened? So he makes the specific, explicit claims about what he needs to believe again. But the truth is, all he really wanted to was to be in the presence of Jesus. And for most of us, most of those I know who have become disillusioned with Jesus and his church, this has been the core longing. A desire to experience Jesus again with a people who are humble and honest about their relationship with him. I believe Jesus' posture towards Thomas is his posture towards everyone who is wrestling with the deep, meaningful questions and doubts. Doubts are a sign of our faith becoming real, not a sign of something broken. Because look at what Jesus says to Thomas next. After offering Thomas to touch the holes in his hands, he says, Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. These are strong words. It seems Jesus considers Thomas to have been faithless up to this point. And let's just be clear. This is a man Jesus personally called. He has walked with him for three years. He has seen miracle on miracle. He was present every time Jesus roasted the religious and political leaders of the day. He was there when Jesus spoke to a dead man to walk out of a tomb, and he did it. And Jesus calls a man who saw all that faithless. The insight is, is plain for us here, isn't it? Walking with Jesus when everything is good requires little faith in him. But when uncertainty and tragedy are present, our faith in Jesus is truly formed. As difficult as these words may seem, we all inherently know this to be true, don't we? This is the case in any meaningful relationship we have. When do you know your friends are truly your friends? Is it when everything is easy or when everything is hard? Odds are it was when everything hit the fan and instead of scattering, they stayed. It was when you got in a fight and they fought for you. When the relationship came under stress and the circumstances became uncertain and they remained steadfast. Why would it be any different with our relationship with Jesus? The Apostle Peter echoes this in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, so be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. Our faith is formed when it's hard to have faith. What the Apostle Thomas says next shows us just how true this is. Because after Jesus shows up, Thomas responds by proclaiming to and about Jesus, My Lord and my God. This is huge. Thomas's proclamation is the strongest that anyone has made about Jesus up to this point. His ardent skepticism has become an unshakable faith. In an instant, in the presence of Jesus, his entire life has been reoriented and his deep face burst out of him. His doubt served as a seedbed for the life-giving faith that would spring up from his soul. Or to quote the scholar D.A. Carson, the most unyielding skeptic has bequeathed to us the most profound confession. I believe this is the gift to those who authentically and honestly wrestle with their doubts. A profound faith. This is why, as I said earlier, the church is the place for those with doubts. Jesus is not bothered that the pains of life have caused you to question who he is. He expects it and sees it as an opportunity for you to have in substance what you only had in theory. Uncertain times produce faith-filled people. I think it's pretty straightforward for us to see why this matters to us today. Particularly if you're watching this and you would say that you are not a Christian. Jesus is not bothered by your skepticism. He welcomes your questions. He simply asks that you take them to the place where you can find answers. Here's what I wanted you to do. I simply want to pray for you right now. I want to pray specifically that your doubts become the fertile soil of your faith. Holy Spirit, right now. I ask that you minister to those who are wrestling with questions about you. 
God, life is hard. It's hard. But you are present in the midst of it. And that's the promise. And so I pray that in the midst of those doubts, that you plant a seed of faith in their hearts that becomes a life-giving tree of faith. That the times of questioning and doubts become simply the journey to knowing you better. And I pray right now that if today is the day that they come to faith, that that walk, that first step be filled with all the joy you intended to be. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Look, if today is your day, the day that you take these doubts and place them in the hands of Jesus and begin to follow him, we want to help you. If you would, text I became a Christian to 94000. Some of our someone from our team will respond promptly to help you take that next step. Welcome home. Look, for those of us who started the day as part of the people of God, my encouragement to us is similar. Since March 2020, nothing has been certain other than uncertainty. Even today is an example of that. I have served as a pastor for nearly a decade and a half, and the idea that we would be canceling corporate worship service with a week's notice would have been unthinkable before then. This is just one of those seemingly endless circumstances that are now in constant flux. For most of us, everything from our jobs to our relationships to parenting to where we live to going to the grocery store has taken on a new level of difficulty, which causes us to doubt many of the things we took for granted. Look, if there's one encouragement that I think the Scriptures offer us today, it's simply this. Have faith. Doubt honestly. Have faith. Doubt honestly. The resilient faith that you have always wanted is being formed in you right now. All you have to do is simply be honest about where you are. So here's what I want us to do this week. I want you to confess your doubts to your community. Perhaps it's your small group from last semester or just some close friends at church. But look, I want to be clear here. Be honest. I am giving you permission to doubt with your church openly. If you are struggling with whether Jesus is God or is there even a God, Say it out loud. If you've begun to doubt the efficacy and the teachings of the Bible, say it. If the U.S. government admitting that UFOs are real has totally got you out of whack, talk about it. Follow the example of our ancient father in the faith. Be honest with where you are and what you need. And I promise you, Jesus will show up for you. I promise you. So as we wrap up today, I want to return to the life of the Apostle Thomas, but not from what we have in the Bible, from what we have from church history. From here, Thomas would follow suit with the rest of the apostles and begin preaching the gospel everywhere he had the opportunity. While most of the other apostles remained around Jerusalem, Thomas' faith led him further away, much, much further away. The Apostle Thomas is generally credited with taking the gospel to the subcontinent of India and perhaps even further east. His faith was so deep and so genuine that it would, he would travel further than any of the other apostles to spread the good news of the resurrected Jesus. I pray that our faith in Jesus, born from these uncertain times, would embolden us to live in the same way. I pray that we could be a people so formed from these uncertain times that our faith would cause us to live a life of gospel emboldenedness in every space we find ourselves. I love you. I'll see you soon.